Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Sonoma County Israeli Film Festival. We are having a community film conversation today about art and music and their therapeutic powers to heal. Um, and uh, my name is Iren Hodes. I am the film festival director and we have welcomed many members of our community here. Um, and a couple of uh, professionals, our special guests, um, whom I would like to briefly introduce. Um, and then we will get started with what I believe will be a very interesting conversation. Um, we have with us today, Mary Hirsch and Jamie Blumenthal. Both are uh, practicing uh, therapists. Mary is an art therapist with many years of, of experience um, here in Sonoma County um, uh, in Sebastopol and Santa Rosa. And Jamie Blumenthal is uh, practicing in music therapy. Um, and she herself is also um, a, a practicing artist outside of her uh, professional life. Um, and thank you both so much for being here. Um, and we are going to be using the two films, the two documentaries that we have watched at the film festival, um, Black Flowers and That Orchestra with the Broken Instruments, a title which I think is amazing. Um, as a jumping off point to talk about art and music and therapy. Uh, we live in trying times and we live in, a, in an interesting county and in an interesting part of the world. And beyond that, we are human beings. And uh, I think um, the topic is relevant to everyone. Um, and so uh, Black Flowers, just as a little reminder, um, is a, a film about uh, five Holocaust survivors who became artists and they're being interviewed while they are also creating art um, and telling their stories of their past. And um, it's a beautiful film because we see how art has healed them or has affected them or art has affected their experience and how they've dealt with trauma in many ways. Um, and the second film, That Orchestra with Broken Instruments, uh, sees a project, uh, a concert that is being uh, prepared for 100 different musicians, amateurs and professionals of all ages from children to um, adults. And um, they are from all over, they are Jerusalemites. So we have Palestinians, uh, Israelis, Jews, Christians, Muslims, different languages, three different composers, meeting for four days to create a concert uh, performance using only broken instruments on purpose. Um, and uh, using that as both a physical metaphor for something larger as well. Um, and so with this, welcome everybody. Um, and uh, let us get started. I would like to ask Mary and Jamie separately or collaboratively what their thoughts were about the films. Um, from their perspective, they've both seen the films multiple times and done their own little bit of research. Um, so I don't know which one of you would like to go first, but I'll let that be your choice. Okay. I, you want to go first? Okay. Mary, sure. Mary, I'll, go I'll ahead, share. Mary, our, okay. our, our therapist, please. Okay, okay. Um, so it is great to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ellen Robin, for inviting me. Um, it, you know, it was interesting. So I, I am speaking about uh, mostly about uh, Black Flowers, and it was a film that I was anxious about seeing. Really, um, I started to see it. I started to screen it at home, and it felt, you know, very hard and heavy. And then I went and saw it at the Rialto a couple of Tuesdays ago, and continued to, you know, carry a lot of uh, of weight. Uh, the stories are intense. But when I came home and I reviewed the movie again for this meeting today um, and took some notes and really, and really thought hard about um, both the five indi individual people's stories as Holocaust survivors and, that, and where they intersect with the kind of art that they've chosen to dedicate their lives to and there's just a ton of richness in there and I I at some point in this in this talk today um, if we have time I mean I have questions for you all about um, about for each one of those artists I, I have a question that came up for me with each one of those artists that I'd love to talk about in a little bit I thought the movie was incredible that's wonderful. Um, I think that that would be wonderful. Um, if we will remember, I'll make a note of it that we can ask a question to everybody. 
Um, I uh, would like to now ask Jamie, I'm going to replace the spotlight so that everybody can see you. Yeah, what did you think of the films? Yeah, I thought they both were wonderful. The um, Black Flowers film, I thought just touched on the whole creative process, the birth, death, rebirth cycle that happens when we're involved in creativity. Um, it also touches on the transformative power of creativity and the, the music film. Uh, that too touches on that whole creative process of going from chaos to order, which uh, happens as part of the creative process. Uh, and it happens as part of, as part of the therapeutic process. And I, I also wanna say that I'm just so thrilled to be here today. Um, thank you for inviting me. And it's uh, really uh, a joy to be able to give back to the community. It was such my pleasure to um, to have you all. Um, I uh, I was looking forward to just um, speaking about uh, about this these films um, with other people who would have a deeper insight um, in that way. So I did want to do now um, uh, if any of the uh, film festival committee are actually we're all here together. We're friends. So I think that um, I'm going to give you all the ability to unmute yourselves. Um, and I think that that would be an easier way to, um, so you are still all muted, um, but uh, I'm going to give you the ability to um, unmute yourselves, participants. I will figure out how to do that in just a moment. So let me ask a question and, um, and, uh, and we can, you can continue with that before we go on to other people being able to ask questions. Um, I don't know much about how you go about um, using art and music as practices in your therapies specifically. So I wanted to ask a little bit uh, if you could give us an example of whether uh, it is an activity or something to be reflected upon. Do you look at art and react to it? Or are you asking your, um, your patients or your clients to um, actively draw or create music? Are we listening or are we doing? Do you understand what I mean? And I'm, I'm just wondering what that looks like. If either one of you wants to give us like a little bit of insight into how that works. Yeah, I, I can go first on that. Um, for music therapy, we always do an assessment first um, and we take a look at what is what is the overall picture. So for each client, it's it's quite different because music therapy is very broad based. It can be used um, for people who are in pain, for uh, those who are in rehabilitation, for maybe from a stroke, or those who are developmentally disabled, or um, even the, those who are getting chemotherapy. As, as well as also psychiatric issues. So it's so broad based. So we always start with an assessment. And for music therapy, it's very, it's, it's both active as well as passive. So clients do get involved in creating the music and in playing the music. And also there's a lot of opportunity for them to share music that they really like and that they listen to and they connect to and to be able to talk about it um, or play to it. So it's very broad based. Do, your, um, do the people that you work with or have you worked with in the past have a musical background or a specific interest in music? Do they come to you for that specific angle of therapy beforehand? Um, you know, initially uh, it, when I first started in this field, people would come to me privately because nothing else worked. And so, uh, so they, they, and so it was viewed as an alternative therapy. Music therapy has shifted now over the several decades I've been in the field. So it's, it's not seen as much as an alternative there. And there's a lot more research that backs up the, uh, the results that we see. But to be honest, a lot of my clients in, throughout my career don't even talk and have not talked. So um, music taps into that nonverbal communication through the instruments. So I've worked with developmentally disabled 
who, um, who have no speech and language, but they only can vocalize, but they can vocalize on pitch. So I can take the pitches that they use and transform that into a musical communication. And we all move rhythmically. So I take a look at what are the rhythms that someone has? Do they move fast through life? Do they move slow? And, and use the music to help match what they are bringing to the session. So um, as I mentioned, music is so broad based and I've, I've worked a lot even with dementia patients who end up oftentimes losing speech and language. And sometimes I work with uh, musicians for the musicians that come to me often it's very difficult because there's some kind of medical issue that goes that is happening for them. So then music brings up issues of loss for them. And so to get back into doing music could be very difficult and emotionally painful because they have to confront those, the loss that they've had in their life. And it, and it could be loss of maybe they can't play like they used to. That's really interesting. It seems that people come from all different sort of places to, to, to use the music. Um, and, and Mary, most people, yes. Most people listen to music in their lives. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting that we have ears, you know, and that, that listening is, is often passive. And so, you know, when you have the radio on, it, you're still being inundated with music, whether, you're, whether you know it or not, or reacting to it or not, which is a little bit different from, I suppose, visual art, which I believe is if that might be what Mary deals with, with visual art. I mean, we all see, or not all of us, and not all of us can hear, of course, but um, it's, a, it's, it's a different medium. Um, could you speak a little bit about how you interact with that? Sure. I, and, and I, you know, Jamie and I spoke a little bit yesterday about our, you know, that, that there isn't a huge difference between, um, you know, music therapy and art therapy in terms of, um, as I see it, um, people come to therapy with a story. And um, <clears throat> it, exactly like the stories that we saw in these, in these films. Um, and oftentimes, when um, when people come in with a story, it's a narrative that they've told themselves their entire life. And, you know, the neuroscience, which is the thing nowadays, we know a lot about how the brain works, um, tells us that if you tell yourself a story enough times, it becomes real and true. And sometimes that story serves you well and sometimes it doesn't. So in, in, when you come in and you're working in creative arts therapies, what we're, what we're looking for um, is a way to, to alter or change that narrative by engaging a different part of the brain. And again, I saw this over and over again in the films um, that uh, um, we, it, by, by turning, you know, and as Jamie said, sometimes people are nonverbal in her world. I wish they were in mine. Oh, the yak, 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 yak all the time. And then, you know, um, uh, but um, when we ask people to come out of that part of their, that language part of their brain to kind of get away from that and to gradually, you know, maybe through some meditation, through some breathing, through, through some yoga through some exercise, whatever, to get into a different part of the brain, um, then we uh, find that we have, that we feel more hopeful, we feel better, we feel different. And I think feeling different is what we're looking for in the therapeutic journey. And I definitely saw that in those movies over and over and over again. Um, and that's interesting what you, what you hit upon. Um, uh, I know that from my own experience that mindfulness is is very much on vogue, but I mean, should always have been. It's a very practical, I think every therapist in every field talks about mindfulness and um, being in the moment and being self-aware. And um, it's interesting what you said, both of you, and that when you are 
doing an act of creation, when you are painting or when you are creating music, it's a different part of your brain. You are not, at, oh, you're, it's almost as if you're not actively able to use the part, the thinking part of the thoughts and the language while you're doing that. Exactly. And I've had people say to me, you know, when I'm doing, when I'm putting marks on paper or have a lump, lump of play in my hand, whatever it is, I can't think about my problems. Other things will do this too. With children, it's play, mm -hmm. juggling. You know, there are things that we just engage in, in our brain and it really takes it. And, and again, every single one of the five people in Black Flowers, every single one of them at some point in their story said exactly this. It takes my mind off it. Otherwise, I'd be thinking bad memories all the time. This gives me another way to be in the world. And I suppose the, the question here is, it, it's wonderful that it takes you away from that. It, it puts you in another place. You don't have to think. But their trauma still expresses itself in that way. So how do they deal with it in a positive way? How Maybe you have an insight into how the brain is in a more productive or in a more positive sort of in, in what way it processes the negative in that we don't have to live in it in the thinking part. I hope that made sense. It did. And, and J Jamie, you can, you can jump in. I don't think, I must say, I don't think that making art, making beautiful things, listening to wonderful music, I don't think that always does take the trauma away. And what these people experienced in their life um, through the Holocaust is not a simple um, fix. And, uh, you know, we got a snapshot of each one of those people um, and a snapshot of their art. Um, and I was struck in the movie with how some of the art was so right in your face. And one, one of the artists, who was it? I have uh, Ruthie who denied ever being in the Holocaust said people look at her work and say, it's so harsh, it's so harsh. And she didn't see it that way. Versus the other end of the spectrum, which was, I think, was it Esther? Esther, who did the needle work? The embroidery, yeah. The embroidery, you know, and, and, and her story seemed very, I'd love to hear what the rest of you think about this, because for me, I kept looking, I kept stopping the film and looking at her images to see whether or not um, the, I, could, I could discern any of her trauma in those images because they're beautiful and they're clearly therapeutic, but they don't directly describe, you know, literally describe in the images, the trauma that she experienced. Yeah. And Jamie, uh, yeah, if you wanna jump in. Yeah, um, so in music therapy, what often happens is um, the emotion is maybe just right under the surface. Mm -hmm. And so when music comes on, someone might uh, express sadness if it's right there. And um, so that's a really important aspect. I think in the movie uh, with the music, when the female conductor was uh, doing um, more of an improvisational thing where there was a little more dissonance, there wasn't as much, um, a structure, I think that can also give opportunity for some of that unconscious material to come up where uh, the other parts of the performance were much more structured. Um, I wanted to share something. I don't know if this is, let me move away here for a second, a, a good time. I've done a lot of um, work on uh, what happens in creative process. And, and so there's, I made a quilt as part of my master's thesis. So I, it's really hard to see, but um, this has eight, eight parts to it. And in the beginning, there's this whole unknown. So it's, it's hard for me to hold it up, but there's this whole unknown and that's the unconscious. And as we begin to uh, become creative, at first there's this chaos and disorganization, and there's tension and release. Discomfort, you can't see this, but it's burlap. If you could touch it, you'd feel the discomfort. 
there's a period of awakening and rest and expression of emotion. There's going into the unknown, forgive me, it's upside down. This is a circular <laughs> type quilt. Um, and then there's the, uh, where we go inward, um, the cocoon, so to speak, where we go inside and inward. Um, and then we come out a little bit different, transformed. And that's part of these elements are part of what happens every time we engage in the creative process. That is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. please, yeah. Mary. Can I just respond to that, Jamie, because it's a beautiful piece you did. And I'm remembering the first man who's the, uh, who opened the movie, the, the sculptor. Is his name? Saadia. His name was Saadia. Saadia. And he, he had a quote that I wrote down here. He said, my work is mostly abstract, a dialogue, and I love this, a collision between the materials and my personality. And that's a wow. really interesting way to think about the, um, you know, we, we, I think sometimes we tend to think of art as this lovely poetic flowing thing, but it can be, you know, very, you know, here was this lovely, gentle man taking care of his wife, um, you know, becoming emotional when he talked about, I think it was Sadia who talked about his liberation by the Russian um, soldier, he and his uncle and friend. And, and so you know that he, you know, he's, he's got that part of him. And then he talks about the collision of his materials, which are hard materials. You know, he, he uses wood and stone and metal um, to somehow um, interface, interface with, his, with who he is. This was interesting to me. Yeah, I think one of the things I find fascinating, and this came up in the music movie, is the um, uh, creativity can hold a diversity of emotion. Right. And, and in one piece or one piece of artwork or one song, um, it can contain and it can hold uh, all different kinds of emotion. And there are very few things I think in the world that can do that simultaneously. And um, in the music uh, movie showed that with the diversity of the ages, the language, the, um, the, the people in it, uh, the backgrounds, and, and then the music was equally diverse and it became this container and this safe space to be able to put all this together, to work together, to integrate and create something new, to give birth to something new. Um, both of your sentiments, your statements are incredibly profound and it, uh, me and my academic hat are going wild about how the arts in general are, incredible vehicles for expressing difficult juxtapositions of their embodiments of paradox, of things that are opposites or that shouldn't be, but are. I mean, humanity, our people are very complex and you'll see that in, in painting. You know, you've got in and of itself a, a soft uh, paint that might be drawing something harsh or a beautiful flower made out of a, a metal and it, it, it you need to pound it. And then the human experience of experiencing it you know does art exist in a vacuum is it the act of creation and the artist or is it does it require someone to experience what you've created as well and it's it's so loaded and I loved Jamie how you described when an orchestra plays together and I have played in orchestras and choirs about mm -hmm. how you create a special not just a safe space but it's an example of the whole being more than the sum of its parts of being able to deal with something that is potentially very traumatic in Israel, you know, in Palestine with wars of, of intense emotion of hatred um, and somehow not necessarily even putting it aside, but bringing everything that you are and finding that one bit of commonality that can become magic when you come together and, and focus on it and build something together. That's what I love about music. It's a little bit different than potentially visual art in that v music is often collaborative because you have composing and multiple voices and multiple instruments coming together in very complex tonal ways to- Right, right. And I, as I mentioned to you, Irene, that um, I 
watched a video on an interview done with the director from the um, movie uh, about the broken instruments. And they talked a lot about how um, it was almost like this whole conflict resolution that happened it within the context of the movie and the poem that was written touched on that and it touched on the pieces inside of us that are broken. Um, and here they were working with uh, broken instruments. So there's this whole way of bringing things together and uh, I don't want to say necessarily solving problems, but a working together and a finding a way to come together. And it was a leap of faith. Absolutely. Because people said yes. in that movie, the, 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 the conductor said, he said, I don't know what we're doing here. And I don't know where we're going. And that's you, a big piece of, of jumping in. And it's hard yes. for us. We want, you know, we want, we want guarantees in this world. And, and it's like that in every art form, even every single artist that uh, was interviewed, they too had a, a leap of faith when right. they entered into their art. They didn't know where it was, how it was gonna come out. Sometimes you have a plan in your head and, and, and as you get into the process, it shifts, it changes. And I wanted to mention to the people on the talk, I know that we have um, Ellen, Robin, who uh, introduced me to our two guests um, and uh, members of our film committee. If you wanna even comment or ask a question, you now have the ability to unmute yourself. Um, feel free to just unmute yourself or raise your hand, or you can type into the comment box if you'd prefer that. Um, but I wanted to make sure that you knew that. And um, I have questions, but I'm sure that you have other insights. I know how much we all loved these films and watching them. Um, so, so feel free. I have a question for the committee actually, yes. while you're thinking. Um, in terms of your process, do you watch, or do you have lots of films um, uh, that are um, entered into this? And, that, and do you have to pare them down? I mean, are there, is it hard to get into this film festival? I can open this up to one of the committee to explain the process if you'd like. I don't know if Andrea or Ellen or um, I don't know, Star, would you like to respond? I can. Oh, uh, Ruth, please. Yeah, hi, I'm Ruth. Um, we get uh, quite a few candidates for the film festival that Ren gets for us. She puts it online and uh, we're basically given assignments of uh, watching uh, two to three of them a week, depending on how many we have. And then we review them as a committee and we rate them on various uh, aspects of the film, the subject matter, the quality of film, particularly the quality of the closed captions because it's important that you could read them. Um, how it relates to the film festival. We, in this case, we truly feel it shows some of the Israeli life. Um, yeah, it goes, it goes through a pretty big uh, vetting process before it gets into the top 10. And then um, we do rate it, give it numbers. And then Iran performs her magic and tries to get the ones that are in the top tier at a price that we could afford to show it. That's pretty much it. And also I'm an artist that I'm working on. My I'm embroidery ask is where- you what you're doing there. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, and I find it very therapeutic. I started this with the pandemic. Although I've, had, I've done other forms of art, including music. So um, it doesn't feel as lonely or isolated. And uh, I love making presents for people. No. Can you hold it? Can you hold it up? I'm so curious. Oh, okay. I'll I'll take it out of the loop. Is this embroidery? It's embroidery. Yeah. I have a grandson who's going to be 18 this month, and he loves horses. Oh, beautiful! Can you see it? Wow! Oh, beautiful! So <laughs> very nice. So it's his birthday's on the 24th. I'm never going to finish by then. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you don't have to do any more films. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. So I will show it to him and hopefully by the end of June, it'll be finished. 
<laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Andrea, did you want to jump in? I saw that you unmuted yourself. Um, sure. Hi, everybody. And thank you, um, Mary and Jamie, for being here. And I wasn't sure if you were seeing the movies. I was unclear about that. So that makes much more sense. So I just have a general question. Um, you know, the Holocaust just, I mean, there's so many various problems in the world, but it's such a complex, horrific issue. And I would sort of bag it a little bit into a complex PS, a PTSD for people. So I'm thinking when you bring someone to their, or, or not bring someone, but encourage people into their healing, whether it's art or music, um, is it, and I suppose it depends on the person, are you helping them become unstuck or guiding them into, you know, something that may, you know, have them um, like maybe with music play a piece or something and that will open up something for them to find their way. It just feels like it's not as straightforward as like a stroke patient, I was in the medical field, stroke patient or <clears throat> something else where you're dealing with X. This is just such a, you know, a horrific um, all encompassing problem. So I just wondered if either one of you, if you want to respond to that, thank you. Um. In the past, when I've worked with Holocaust survivors, it's been within the context of like when I've worked at Jewish Homes for the Aging outside of Los Angeles, um, there were several survivors or I worked at Rhoda Goldman Plaza. Um, so music therapy there was done sometimes individually, but more often as part of a group activity. So, um, it wasn't done as a way to help open them up or to heal, but to have them join in and be part of the group. So it's a very different focus than if someone were coming to me individually because they have PTSD from the, from mm -hmm. the Holocaust. Um, other things that, that have come to mind is, um, you know, music was, played at the concentration camps. And I remember as a student reading a story about a Holocaust survivor who was in one of the infirmaries and heard a piece of music being played outside. And that helped give them the will to survive. Mm -hmm. So there's so many different um, nuances and aspects uh, to it. Um, and we know that music also very much is connected to memory and, and triggers memory. So it's also individualized, at least for music therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And connection is a big part. As you yes. said, it, it, it opens up this rather than trying to go to this hard place. Right. So when I worked in the facilities, it, it wasn't geared towards... Um, you know, the, the psychological depth, uh, in-depth uh, work. It was really geared towards more of an activity therapy. And I often was working with clients who had dementia also. And they would revert to the, you know, their primary language. So we would sing songs with that, that were in that primary language too. Thank you. But Mary, you can speak to it from a different perspective. Thank you. I've forgotten the question. Oh, um, it, it, generally, I think you were saying, Andrea, um, in, in treating complicated grief and long-term PTSD, can we, can we move to an actual cure for this through the arts? Is that what you're asking? Well, I was just, no, not a cure, but um, I wasn't sure if the initial process was like kind of going in the back door a little bit and guiding people to maybe a first step or as um, Jamie said to a connection um, or whether it was like letting them focus on just kind of whatever arises for them in the process. Right. I think, I think all of the above. I think it's, I think Jamie said this too. It's very individual um, and certainly working with children is, different than working with adults. Um, 
but I, I usually, you know, I, I, I usually begin with, with talking with clients and then I listen for mm-hmm. the word, the image that seems particularly visual and or repetitive. Um, one of the things that I've discovered that I think is so interesting about working with clients um, who have had a traumatic uh, childhood adults is that typically we will hear, I can't remember anything about my childhood. I just don't ask me because I can't remember anything. And so if I, of course I accept that, but if I ask people a sensory based question about a memory, they're right there. So I might say, what did it smell like in your house, in the kitchen? Or um, what was the, what did you hear? What was the noise level like? And typically people will go right into it. Oh, you know, it was just always loud and there was so much drinking and, and partying and I had to go into my room and shut the door. So, you know, you can really, um, again, if you get people away from the, um, the, the wordy uh-huh. part of their brain. Um, and, 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 and like Jamie said, it's right below the surface. I think it's very, people are very ready to go there as mm-hmm. a rule. They don't like, they're not so crazy about mindfulness <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or deep breathing. They say, oh, my, my mother used to make me do that. But, um, but it, it, there, we, are, we are sensory creatures. Yeah, and I wanted to add to that, Mary. Um, in when I wrote my master's thesis, was which was also about uh, loss and using creative arts to heal. What I also came to learn is that when we experience trauma, we're not usually talking through trauma. It's more of a sensory thing. So it, it touches on all all of what you said, Mary, and that nonverbal. And because the art and the music use that same language, it's, it can tap into that um, very easily and sometimes quite quickly for people. But uh, the other thing I wanted to add is that, uh, you know, with some of the Holocaust survivors, when I would see them in old age, what I might see would be anxiety and, and that kind of stress response um, and that would be that sometimes there were clients that I worked with to reduce just the overall anxiety and stress that was being exhibited um, later in life, especially if there was dementia. So it would still be there and come out in a different way. Mm-hmm. I also I also want to say, adding to that, Jamie, is that um, I, th- I think you're and I think you may have asked this question early on in, in our talk today. Um, you know, look sort of the why of the art and and what happens when you when somebody puts marks on a paper, creates something, makes it a, a shape out of clay, whatever, is that if that now exists in the world. It's here. Yes. And 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 you see this, of course, over and over in these images in the movie. Um, and so people can we, we're not great at mem- remembering, um, you know, in, in our brains, uh, what happened in last week's session. But when I can present the image, when I could just have it on the table and I can say, you know, and we can add to that image as the weeks go on. And then people can remember what, you know, what, what transpired between us. And it's really, it's really very handy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering, we are, we're not towards the end, but I did want to end this at an hour. So if anybody would like to ask questions, please uh, start thinking of them now. But I did want to uh, remind uh, Mary that she wanted to ask us some specific questions about the film. And also, I'm hoping that towards the end, you might leave us with um, if not some words of advice, but just some something to take away um, about whether, and I don't like using the word ordinary people or people who are not, you know, seeking active therapy for, for trauma specifically, or who are not in therapy, what, um, what might be the benefits of adding a creative activity to their lives and what they could expect might 
change in their lives or what is what is a benefit of a person who is not necessarily a creative a creative or does not define themselves as a creative person by adding some sort of uh activity in that respect given the chaotic world in which we live so um ask ruth, yeah. ask ruth that question she will tell you exactly <laughs> Well, I could answer it myself too. I have the similar situation as completely spontaneously. I began collaging over the, during the pandemic. Like it, I, it was one of these things where there was literally no thought. It was a bad night. I happened to have a stack of magazines in Elmer's glue and went at it for eight hours and I've been doing it ever since. And so I completely just intuitively know that this came out of my body um, and have continued it. And so um I'm wondering if, you know, other people might, I don't know what ha happens with the brain in, in somebody getting some sort of comfort or just doing it spontaneously, what that might be, but maybe you can share what that does to a person in their practice or in their daily lives. What, what does that mean? Can I say before, there's a lot to talk about in 20 minutes, but um, I, I want to just recommend to people, if you haven't seen it, there's a wonderful show at the Sonoma, downtown Sonoma County Museum on feminist art. Um, I think it's going to be there a little bit longer. That's a lovely little museum. It's just our size, you know, at our age. It is. I highly recommend it. We have a relationship with the director there. So the Sonoma County Museum of Art and History down on, I believe it's 7th Street near right. the mall in Santa Rosa. I highly recommend the Feminist Art Show. Thank you, Mary. Feminist Art Show and also the An Ansel Adams uh, in the main building. Um, did a, a beautiful uh, show on the um, his photographs of the Japanese internment camps. And it's very, both of those shows are really wonderful. So. So. Star wants to say something. Yeah, I just, I just want to corroborate with all of that. I'm, you know, as a theater arts and dance director and teacher, I just see, you know, as soon as you, you go through that process, it changes people. You know, then it's it's always beautiful, whether it's kids or or grownups, you know, seniors who, you know, had a hard time walking, and all of a sudden, you know, through the process of of uh, going through their part on stage, they're walking again. You know, and it's just like it takes their mind off of it, and now they're involved in in something creative and, and a teamwork and right. So it's all beautiful. Star, I don't know if you experience this, you know, this a little bit of resistance or a lot of resistance as people try something new. So, you know, for oh. typically, and I've heard this for years, people will come into my studio, mostly adults, but some kids and say, art, I don't like art. I draw like a 10 year old, that happens to be true, but that's another question about education, art education. <laughs> so don't make me draw because I don't like it. And 30 minutes later, if I have put the right materials on the table, I cannot stop people from making yeah. it. And uh I do think, and I've felt this for years, I think that we are all of us, myself included, starving for creative experiences and we don't even know it. Right. I so agree with you. it's a little bit like me and salad. I'm probably not going to eat it on my own, but if you put it in front of me, <laughs> I'm all for it. Right. I, I, I've seen kids not be able to read. And after about uh, three or four or five months of tap dancing, they can read. Yeah, it's just putting that left, right in the right spots. And don't get yeah. me started about schools and education. Oh, I know. I, I right. was Mary. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I know. And yeah, I know but, you, I know you have you have had a lot you you've saved a lot of kids. Well, thank you. Up. But yeah, I was just talking about a student yesterday with a, a former student who um, was so resistant, eyeballs rolling the whole time. You know, the whole any of the theater games. This is stupid. This is dumb. And by the end of the year, she was the best actor. She was the most interested and the most motivated. And it was just, it, it was amazing to watch that transformation. Yeah. And in the, in theater, 
and in music and sometimes in art, you're also having to be aware of your partner, of your, yeah. your outside mm -hmm. yourself, because part of your job is making the people in that scene with you or on that stage with you look good too. Absolutely, that's my Beautiful. mantra. Your job is to make everybody else look good. Right. Right. <laughs> It's wonderful. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for for your your uh, contribution, your input, and it's wonderful what both yeah. of you do. And thank yeah. you, Ellen, for bringing Mary and Jamie. And um, maybe Mary, if you wanted to ask your question, I didn't want right. to forget. If you wanted to yeah. ask all of us a question. So, in the interest of time, so I, I I made some notes on each one of the artists, but and then a question. But in the interest of time. Let me see what would be most interesting to you. Um, oh, here's one, Tommy. Tommy, I loved that guy. He was so interesting. He was. He said he was going to try his hand at all crafts, trying everything, which I thought was just beautiful. And one of the things that he said, he said, you know, like he wasn't the only person who said. I didn't want to have the Holocaust in my life. My children didn't know I was a survivor. Sometimes my, my spouse didn't know I was a survivor. Um, and so what he said was that when he lectures, oh, and then of course he got the, he, I thought this was fascinating. He was, at a, he was lecturing um, and he got that gift from the, grandson of the commander of Auschwitz and it's and his 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 description was that he he froze he was he was confused he didn't know what he was feeling I mean he was really having a kind of a disassociative experience but then he said um, that the things that he can't let out with his loved ones in his life he can talk about at these lectures and I wondered why you all thought that was. Like, I don't know. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so um, I have the advantage of having just seen the movie like, you know, 12 hours ago. So I, it's clear in my mind. So Tommy, you remember Tommy? Kind mm -hmm. of in the middle of the movie. And he was, um, he said he'd been a gardener and a builder for 50 years. And I think his Holocaust story um, he was a baby. I remember this. He was, he was the baby, baby that the mother had, had to ransom him. Yes, yes, they had to ransom him. Um, and he said, my children don't know I'm a survivor. I can let all that out. All that I don't want to talk about, I can let out at my lectures. He lectures on the war and on the Holocaust. And, he went, and I wondered, why do you think he was able to talk about these things publicly with strangers, but not privately with his own family. That's my I question. think that there was a shift though, from what I understood in his story is that um, his mother was the only reason anyone knew that he was a Holocaust survivor. She was he the thought. one that told his children and his right. mother. And it wasn't, there was some sort of a breakthrough and it might've been when he visited Auschwitz for the first time and also met this person who gave him a pin. And it was something all of a sudden he was like, now my life's goal is to tell the story as much as possible. He did a complete 180. It was from total <laughs> denial. Yeah. Yeah. He's writing a book and he said, if I want to know about my life, I go to my wife and children because they heard the stories from my wife, from my mother, the stories that I couldn't tell. Mm -hmm. And you hear something similar with the final um, story, and that's um, Ruti, the one who drew the black flowers, who doesn't yeah. want to be a Holocaust survivor. Right. Um, because all it. five of these people were at different stages, it looks like, of di very different places of even accepting their identity right. um, as to how they did what they did. Um, right. And it seemed, uh, so we had a talk with the director on Thursday of Black Flowers. Mm -hmm. And she told us that Ruti, the woman who paints at the end, did never talked about the Holocaust until she interviewed her for the film. She and her children would never have known. Her son had said, we didn't know how complex this all was. She didn't want to talk about it so much so. And she thanked the filmmaker. You know, she herself, through the process of being filmed, 
and talking little bits and pieces and painting, she was putting together the connections of there are so many women in my paintings and I don't know why I didn't know my mother. I only have sons, but it comes out and I don't know why. And she was putting the pieces together while she was being filmed. And I think the whole meta thing, we're also seeing the act of creating a film, the act of creating another art piece about art in and of itself is also therapeutic. Look at us, we're talking about it. Yes, yes, I thought that was very interesting. She said, I have no, she didn't want to know anything about her mother had disappeared. She wanted nothing to know about her. She didn't want to know this or she was very little when that happened. She was under two, I think. And she said, I don't have women in my life. I don't have mother, I don't have sisters. And yet my paintings are full of women. It comes out. Yeah. yeah. It always comes out because it's so, it's right there inside right yeah and i think it's a little easier to control what comes out if you're talking to someone you don't know but if it's your spouse or your children or your grandchildren that have not heard um i think that deeper place is harder maybe to control you know it's like it really triggers you can feel like oh my god huge thing is going to come out whereas if you're speaking maybe a little bit more of a step back I thought the same thing, Andrea. I thought easier to it's a, it's it's a it's another step a step away from the um, primary trauma. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if this is too large of a topic to explode at the last you know five minutes as we're wrapping up, um, but I'm wondering if um, you wanted to or were able to at least touch upon um, the last couple of years in the pandemic that we've had and. I'm wondering if you've been doing remote therapy and you know if that has affected how you work with people in the arts and um, any last words you'd like to leave us with. Um, so I'm gonna open that just to Mary and Jamie as a sort of last couple of thoughts. Yeah, I can speak to that. I'm sure Mary can too. I, so I've been uh, teaching students through Zoom and I only recently started uh, teaching again in person. And it's been an interesting challenge to teach piano through the Zoom. Um, I've done a lot of recordings and, and in many ways it's, it's actually I, um, opened up another way to help teach uh, through recordings. So I often will record what I, what I play or assign for a student. And having a recording has been really incredibly helpful for them during the week when they're home practicing. Um, I think during the pandemic, one of the things that's been so difficult for all of us as a, as a world, and we saw this in the beginning, is that we weren't going to hear live music anymore. And live music was happening in our balconies or in the backyard and, um, and initially I, I got together with a friend in my backyard and I was so self-conscious about it because the neighbors could hear, <laughs> but, um, but they all appreciated that because they couldn't go to hear live music. Um, and, and for me on a personal note, one of the things I started doing is I, it was an opportunity to learn klezmer music. And so I started taking some klezmer lessons and so I've met people all over the world that come together on Zoom to play klezmer. And that, so it, it's been um, both difficult and, and it's also had some really positive things. And I see that with my students also. Necessity is the mother of invention. Oftentimes. It is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And Mary, any final um, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you that my practice um, was very affected by COVID. Um, I no longer work with children after really like 40 years of being almost primarily a, a child therapist. I now just work with teens and adults. It's very, very interesting. Um, and I, I, I think I was ready. I didn't know it but I was ready to, it was a very intense job, a lot of play, you know, and, uh, but, um, there, but there's a need, there's a terrible need. Me and every other therapist I know gets calls, if not daily, 
several times a week, somebody looking for a therapist for their child and I have nowhere to send them. So it, yeah, it's, we have a lot to work through in, in, in the future for sure. Um, but I mean, I, I do almost all um, Zoom calls. I do a couple of people in person and I love my work and I loved this lovely gathering. So mm -hmm. thank you. And I will watch those movies again. Um, thank you so much, Mary, Mary Hirsch and Jamie Blumenthal um, for coming to speak with us. I wanna thank members of the film committee and members of the public who joined us today. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation. I wish we can continue it for longer, but I'm glad that it happened. Um, the, we, we have such wonderful things to talk about and this in and of itself, um, you watching films uh, has led people to come together and, and speak about a topic that I, I have certainly learned a lot today um, and really appreciate your time and your insight. Um, so on behalf of the Jewish Community Center of Sonoma County and the Israeli Film Festival of 2022, our first back in person and online at the same time, um, three more days for anybody on the call who is still welcome to um, uh, uh, watch films online for a few more days. Um, thank you wholeheartedly. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day um, and uh, uh, happy mental health to you all. And I hope that we all uh, continue with creative pursuits in our, in our daily lives. So, thank so thank you so much, yeah, everybody. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. It was beautiful. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye.